Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We are so lucky today to have our guests, our panelists. Uh, We have Jeff from Chicago, Illinois. And Megan from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they're going to talk today about returning to school, so going to school sober. Very exciting. I know for me, I got out of jail. This is Jeff. Or Kansas. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm all over the place. Welcome. Good to see you. Have a seat. Um, for me, I got out of jail. I spent six months in jail, and then I went right back to college, and it was a surreal experience. Um, it was like I was on sabbatical, and um, and I showed up, and some of the people knew, like one of my teachers, his wife was the prosecuting attorney that put me in jail, you know, and I, I was in class once, and I said, is there a vending machine around here? And he was like, yeah, but there's no beer in it, so you don't need it, you know, and I, and I was like, whoa. But I, I had all kinds of awkward experiences after that, of just being there and um, and thinking everybody knew, you know, they all knew, they all knew, they all knew, and it was really just terribly awkward um, experience for me, but I got through it um, for that small time that I went back, and it was only because of people in Alcoholics Anonymous so I could go hang out with them, you know, and, uh, and so I was re- I'm, I'm really excited to hear you guys talk, and we're just going to go right down the list, so um, Jeff, Jeff from Chicago, thank you. Thanks, Sean, for getting us started. I'm Jeff, I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here today. Um, First off, I want to thank Ian and Stacy for asking me to speak here on this panel. Uh, I got to say how proud I am of all the St. Louis people for pulling this conference off. I, uh, I live in Chicago now, but I got sober in St. Louis, and I, I was sober here for five years before I moved up to Chicago. And um, I got to say, uh, you know, when I left St. Louis almost 10 years ago, this conference would not have been possible. So it's really in the past 10 years since I've been gone, which I don't know if that's a reflection on me or not, but in the past 10 years since I've been gone, there's really been a groundswell of young people coming together and sobriety to really pull something like this off, and it's pretty amazing to watch. So I'm really grateful to be here and be a part of this, even if this, even if it is just you know the small part that I'm playing now. So I'm glad to be here, and great job, St. Louis young people. Um, so... To let you know a little bit about myself before I get into it, uh, there's three, there's a little tradition in my home group. There's three things that I want to let you guys know about. First is that I have a sobriety date. That's September 2nd, 1997. The second is that I have a home group. It's the Evanston group up in Chicago. So if you're ever in town on a Friday or a Sunday night, look me up and, uh, I'll try to get you out to the meeting. And then the third is that I have a sponsor and, and, uh, his name is James and I love James. He, uh, he got sober younger. And uh, he's grown up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he, he texted me yesterday uh, before the conference started about this talk specifically. And he said, uh, he gave me two pieces of advice. The first is do good. And the second is wear pants. So I've got successfully, I've got the pants on. We'll see about the do good part. Um, and then he told me that he was meditating naked, which I don't know if I should take him seriously or not. But I kind of hope that I should because uh, it would be pretty awesome. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, here we go. Uh, sober in school. First, let me, uh, show of hands. How many people are in school or have been in school in sobriety? So pretty much everybody. That's awesome. So you all have a little bit of experience with this already. So there's probably nothing new that I'm going to share with you guys out of my own experience today. Um, like I said, I got sober here in St. Louis at five years sober. I moved to Chicago for the purpose of going to school. Uh, I applied to two schools. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, my first week sober was actually my first week in college. Uh, and needless to say, I didn't do very well. I, uh, I went to a little community college here called Merrimack, and uh, I signed up for classes. I went maybe for two weeks to classes, and then I didn't go back for the rest of the semester, and teachers don't really like that a whole lot. You don't get many passing grades if that's how you approach school. And then the second semester, I did the exact same thing. I showed up for class, or I, I signed up for class, showed up for two weeks, and then I didn't go back. So I bombed probably the first six classes I ever took in college. And, um, you know, it, it's really like the rest of my sobriety. You know, it's, it's mostly a lot of failure. 
Um, and then I have an experience that changes my attitude and then I have a new approach to it. And that's exactly what it was with school. That was my first year in school. I decided to take a year off and, um, I don't know, hang out, work a little bit. I don't really know what, what my plan was, but, uh, I took a year off after I bombed my first year and, and that's when that change happened for me. And truthfully, it was when I got into the steps and really started to have a spiritual experience that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous that I was able to really show up in life, show up to school and, um, and do something other than what I do left to my own devices. Um, so after that year, I, I went back to school. I signed up, uh, and retook some of the classes that I took before and, um, I started to get A's. You know, and, and some B's, but I started to have a little bit more success than I did before. And, um, I hung out at Merrimack for about another three or four years, just going part time, retaking the classes that I had failed before and, um, taking some new classes all the while, you know, raising my GPA, doing better, getting A's and B's in the classes that I had failed before and the new classes, getting A's and B's and, and pretty soon I had taken all the classes that I could take for credit, right? So that meant it was time to transfer and do something else. And um, what ended up happening is I applied to two schools, two universities, one here in St. Louis and one in Chicago. And the one in Chicago decided that they were going to give me more money than the one that I applied to here. So, of course, I chose them. And uh, and really what a, what a surreal experience uh, having a school say that they're going to give you a, a pile of money to come take classes at their institution. You know, I'm, I'm the guy in high school that I walked across the stage at graduation not knowing if there was going to be a diploma in the envelope. And, and here I am, the school's offering to give me money, scholarships and grants, to come to their school to take classes and learn. And, um, I mean, talk about great events will come to pass, you know, really. And uh, and really that, that's, uh, that promise is, is what kind of followed me throughout my college career. And I love that they read that from a vision for you last night at the meeting because that's exactly what I what I kind of wanted to talk about here is great events will come to pass for you and countless others. And me being in, in school sober is really one of those great events for me. Um, so I, I moved up to Chicago, and that's really when I started to have an experience sober too. I mean, you know, my first five years were great. I worked the steps. There was a fellowship that surrounded me and enveloped me, and I really felt safe. But really, you know, God's plan for me was to move to Chicago and have my own experience. And that's really what I started to have when I moved up there and, and went to school. And, um, you know, I moved up there and I don't know if you've ever had the chance to move to a new place in sobriety, but it, it's pretty uh, scary, uh, but at the same time exciting. And, uh, you know, if you if you get the chance to do that, I highly suggest you do it because it really, for me, was when I really started to trust that God had me and that uh, God was showing up in my life to take care of me. My first three months in Chicago, I had a drink and dream almost every night. Um, you know, I, I was five years sober, but I felt like the new guy all over again. And I had to reach out to the fellowship. And, uh, you know, there's, there's also that line in a vision for you. It says, God will determine that, so you must remember that the real reliance is always upon Him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. And that's what my experience was when I moved up to Chicago, not knowing anyone, feeling like the new guy again. There was this fellowship that I craved, that I knew from back home here, that I didn't have yet in Chicago. And uh, what it really meant for me is I had to reach out. And, uh, you know, being the good, defiant drunk that I was, it took me a while to um, to really reach out and to find a sponsor and a home group up here. Uh, I think I was up here for, or up in Chicago for about a month before I really settled on a sponsor and a home group. But once I did, again, Alcoholics Anonymous, that fellowship enveloped me and I really started to feel safe. And that was my support in going to school. And, and that's what it's grown from since I've been up there. Um, so I, I moved up to Chicago to go to school and, and, uh, that fellowship, you know, I had the fellowship in AA and then there was the fellowship of people who were in AA, but I met at school at the same time. And there were a couple of people that I knew on campus that I would see who I knew were also sober. There was one of my closest friends still to this day. Uh, his name is Kevin. And uh, I went to Loyola, Chicago, which is a Catholic Jesuit school. And uh, he had a couple of years sober, but he was studying to be a Jesuit priest. And he and I 
would hang out on campus a couple times a week. He'd invite me over to the Jesuit residence, and we'd invade the Jesuits' food, and we'd have lunch and hang out in the Jesuits' house. It was pretty hilarious. The big Jesuit residence and then the little Jesuit residence, and we'd invade both of them. And it's funny because the big Jesuit residence, I mean, it was beautiful right on the lake, Lake Michigan, awesome view. It's this great, beautiful, big old house. And we'd sit there in the cafeteria, and it'd be me and him at this table eating lunch and talking about being sober, and we're surrounded by like 30 or 40 priests. Some of them I had in class, and all of them are old, crusty dinosaurs, you know. And there's me and him sitting there just being sober and, and being in school. It was amazing. Uh, there was a, another girl that I met who... Uh, she had been going to Syracuse. She failed out, moved back home with her folks to Chicago, and she started going to Loyola to take classes. So here I am surrounded by a bunch of rejects, people who are failures at life. You know, she couldn't uh, cut it being – she wasn't sober at Syracuse, but uh, she drank herself out of school there. So that's what I mean by a reject. So she came home. So I'm surrounded by these rejects, people – who are getting sober, who were sober, you know, we're all failures at life, but here we are showing up and having a little bit of success on campus sober, uh, going to school. Um, so I would show up and I went to class and, and, um, you know, from the spiritual experience that I was able to have, I was able to approach school with this power that I didn't know before. And, and that power was really what gave me the ability to show up in class. And I can tell you today that my experience at Merrimack compared to what it was at Loyola, um, the reason why I couldn't show up in Merrimack was because I was just so full of fear. You know, I had kind of made an approach at the steps, a pretty feeble one, uh, had written a pretty surface inventory. I, I really didn't get it down to a whole lot of real fears and resentments. So there was still that stuff blocking me off. But at this point, I had, I had written a couple of more inventories. I was really able to see what it was that blocked me off in life from having any success. And I was able to show up. And that was the difference for me is that I started to have this experience, you know, and I was given the power to show up in class. Um, and that's why I was able to eventually graduate, right? Um, since I graduated from Loyola, uh, I've been able to go to graduate school, another school in uh, Chicago called DePaul. And uh, it, it's amazing. And this was really my experience with Loyola, too, same as DePaul, is I have no idea how... I picked these schools. I really don't. Like, I don't remember what the thought process was in deciding even to apply to these schools, much less to go to them. But there they were, the acceptance letters in front of me. And I don't, I, honestly, I really don't know how that happened. I do remember uh, grad school for me started a couple of years after I'd gotten married. And, and um, the only reason why I decided to apply was because my wife, Colleen, uh, was going to start going to school. She was finishing up her undergrad. And she just, like, in passing one day, she's like, well, why don't you start applying and looking at graduate schools? And literally, like, a month later, I was in school. Like, it was incredible. I, I, and, and that's really how things happen for me in, in my sobriety. Like, if it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen, and I don't even know how or why it does, but it does. So that's how it happened for me, and I'm going to DePaul, um, and... uh the, the the program that I found was incredible. It was exactly what I wanted to do, even though I didn't know I wanted to do it. it uh, public service management is what my degree is in. I have a, a, a uh, focus in nonprofit administration. So it's everybody in this program. They were very mission-based, you know, nonprofit organization-oriented kind of people, which is where my passion is today. But at the same time, the program, they had these condensed uh, study abroad programs. Um and I did a couple of these while I was in graduate school. And I went um, to Ireland twice. I went to Belgium once. Uh, and I studied at some institutions overseas. And what an incredible experience. I mean, that's something that a guy like me doesn't get to do. You know, like I said, I barely made it out of high school. Um, and to have these experiences of going to other countries and studying the way that they do things, it's unreal. Um, and, and the big difference, I think, between my time at DePaul and, and Loyola was that I didn't have anybody who was sober at DePaul. These were people who were in the world, not alcoholics, um, you know, people who don't have the problems with showing up in life that we have. You know, these people aren't failures. They aren't rejects. These people know how to show up at life. And I'm surrounded in class by 25, 30 of these people at a time. And I'm like, what do you like? How do I even relate to you? You know what I mean? 
Um, but because I'd been sober and had some of the experiences I'd had, I developed the ability to have relationships with people even outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm grateful for that because I still, um, I keep in touch with a lot of those people that I went to grad school with. And, and, um, I guess, you know, the end result of that is that I have some people that I can call professional contacts, you know, um, which is weird in and of itself. A guy like me saying that I have professional contacts. I don't even know how that happens really. Um, but you know, that, that's really my experience of being sober in school and, um, you know, I think the theme of what it really boils down to in me attending class, um, and this is true throughout my life, um, but it's that line, great events will come to pass for you and countless others. And what I have to put first uh, in my sobriety is, you know, focusing on spiritual principles. If I can incorporate spiritual principles into my life, I really can do anything. And that's something that somebody told me early on in sobriety, that if, if I stay sober... I can do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and, and all of you who raised your hand in here who have been in school or who are in school now, you know, that's true, too. You know, we don't belong doing the things that we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, I can't stop going to jail on my own. That's the best I can do. I go to jail and then I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the absolute best I got at life. And here I am. I got a couple of degrees. Um, I have friends in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I can go to almost any corner of the country and I know somebody there from the program. You know, what a, what a great deal for people like us. And, um, I'm grateful to be a part of this program. I'm grateful to be a part of this conference. I'm glad you all guys got up. Some of you, I'm, I know you haven't even been to bed yet, so I'm glad that you crawled your way down here, slammed a couple of Red Bulls and made your way down to this meeting. So, uh, it's good to see all your smiling faces and, uh, I'll turn it back over to Sean. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great testament to Alcoholics Anonymous. We really appreciated your story. And now we're going to move right along. And I know Megan um, locally, and I know that she's just a uh, she's a um, she's a great example of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she helps a lot of women in this program. So I'm really excited to hear her talk about sober in school. And here's Megan from St. Louis. Hello, I'm Megan. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here. I might have trouble keeping my eyes open, but I'm going to try to stay with you guys. Um, I did get sober while going to school, and I'm still in school, so I guess I'll share my experience um, with being sober in school. Um, I started drinking when I was probably, oh, I guess I should say, my sobriety date is January 6th of 2007. Um, I do actively work the 12 steps with my sponsor, and I have the privilege of sponsoring a few young ladies in these rooms. Um, so anyway, I started drinking young, obviously, because I got sober young. Um, I was about 12, probably, and um, um, I don't know. I hit the ground running and had alcohol poisoning the first time I drank and loved it and wanted to do it again and again. Um, that was in grade school, so I went to high school at an all-girls Catholic school, um, and I found the girls that drank like I did, and if they didn't drink like I did, it was my mission to get them drunk, because I thought that I was giving them, like, this amazing gift of discovering alcohol, because I thought it was the best thing in the world, so, um... That's what I did. I hung out with people that drink like I did, or I tried to introduce them to alcohol and get them to drink like I did. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to get too much into that, but things got bad fast. It went from um, drinking and having fun to drinking with a lot of consequences to drinking to feel just normal um, and feeling like I was crawling out of my skin if I wasn't drinking. Um, and I hated myself. And I didn't have a direction in life. I woke up every day just not hating my life and not really, like, I didn't have any motion, motivation to do anything except for drink. Um, and I have always been, I've always kept school as a priority. Um, even when I was drinking, I was getting A's and B's. Somehow, um, I would drink, like, only on the weekends, and then it was, like, okay, I'll do my homework, and then I'll drink, and then it was, like, I'm going to drink and try to do my homework. 
which didn't really work out good well. But um, So I always kind of had my foot in the door with school, but um, towards the end, things started falling apart. You can't get a lot accomplished when you're drunk and trying to do homework, so... Um, but I was introduced to AA my the summer before going into my junior year of high school when I was um, just had just turned 17. So I started going to meetings. My experience was that I loved meetings um, because I related to people. These people drink like I did. They felt like I did. I just like felt this commonality with them. Um, they started talking about sobriety, and I didn't get that. I didn't get how you could live without alcohol. It was scared the shit out of me because um, like it was my security blanket. I used it for everything. So I was scared as hell. Um, but I liked going to meetings and hearing what people said. My biggest um, – the reason I was a chronic relapser for – um, a good six months, and the big reason was um, I was trying to live two lives still. I was trying to go to high school and be this normal high school student and, like, fit in with the popular crowd and everything, and then trying to, like, go to AA and maybe, like, try to stay sober and try to get happy. Um, and people told me, like, hang out with sober people, get a sponsor, pray, work the steps, and I didn't do it. I went to meetings, and I tried to um, keep my old life going. And if anyone has done that in here, it's miserable. Um, I played victim a lot my first six months. I felt really, really sorry for myself that I was 17 years old, and having to get sober, and everyone else my age was, like, out drinking and having fun, and people would come to school and, like, talk about their weekends, and then by the end of the week, everyone was talking about, like, the parties they were going to and stuff, and it was just really hard because I, I like, kind of wanted to be an AA and be involved, but then every day going to school was, here it was in my face, was my old life. Um... Some other things I really struggled with was I identified as this party girl. Like, that's what people knew me as, and I kind of I took pride in it. I took pride that I could hold my alcohol um, until a certain point. I could drink a lot, but then I would push it over the edge and throw up everywhere and pee everywhere and um, get just messy. Um, but I took pride in it nonetheless, I guess. Um, so that was really hard for me to, like, let go of that. Um, I didn't want to, like, I don't know. I just, like, I guess I just really felt like I, like, fit in when I was the party girl and stuff. So that was really hard for me to let go of that and, like, let go of being, um, like, in that center of all the stuff going on on the weekends and, like, knowing what was going on with who and what and everything. Um... And then another big thing was people telling me I didn't have a problem. They'd be like, you're not really that bad, like, blah, blah, blah. Um, like, we do the same thing. And that was hard because I felt like I had to, like, prove myself and say, like, well, actually, I'm not normal because of this or that. But, I mean, people don't want to lose their drinking buddies, for one. Two, people don't like that awkwardness of, like, trying to talk with someone when they have a problem, so they want to make it better. So um, what I basically had to learn was it, it doesn't matter if they understand because probably most likely if someone's not an alcoholic, they're not going to understand, and they're not going to understand why you drink the way you do. And they didn't understand that, <clears throat> yes, I sometimes drink like them at parties, but I also drink by myself all the time um, and sat in my room depressed and... I don't know, drew pictures and stuff. <laughs> um, and so they didn't they didn't understand. And for me to ask them to understand isn't really fair because they weren't experienced what I was experiencing. Um, so I kind of had to let go of explaining it to people. Um, another thing was when I came into AA at 17, I felt so awkward. Um because I was used to socializing drunk, and that was easy for me, and I could talk to whoever, and I could flirt with whoever. Um, 
And when I got here, I didn't have that crutch, and it was just me and my sober body. And I literally didn't know how to stand. I didn't know where to put my hands. I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to say. I was just like a nervous mess. And it was really, really uncomfortable. And if anyone is new and feeling like that, that's completely normal. Um, and it did take a little bit to grow out of and like get used to because you're learning this new concept of like how to socialize sober. So it took a while, but, um, what really saved me was the fellowship here because people didn't give up on me. They would constantly like ask me to hang out and stuff. And I felt really weird about that because I felt like I was younger than a lot of people. And I was younger than a lot of people, but, um, a lot of them were like in their twenties and I didn't understand that like they did want to hang out with me and that like age didn't matter. And now I see that because I'm 23 and I don't care how old you are and I'll hang out with my 16 year old sponsees and that's cool. Um, because we get each other, but I didn't understand that. So I, I really felt like I didn't fit in, but I just kind of really, kind of kept putting myself out there putting myself in situations that were very uncomfortable, but the more I did them, the easier it got. Um, my first sober dance was so painful, and I was like, there's no way I'm getting up there. And they drug me up there, and by the end of the night, like at the very end of the night, <clears throat> there was like four people on the dance floor, and I was one of them. And I was like, how did this happen? I'm dancing sober. This is crazy. And now, like, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so, let's see. I took some notes on stuff I wanted to touch on. Um, but I did, I relapsed for a while, and that's because I kept trying to hang out with people. Um, my last drink was actually at school. Um, I was dating an alcoholic, and that didn't go very well, and he cheated on me, and... I was so distraught. Um, I didn't use any of the tools that anyone gave me. My mind just went to, I'm scared and hurt and pissed off and I'm going to drink. Um, by that point, my friends knew that I, my good friends that knew I was trying to get sober wouldn't like give me alcohol. So I, um, my own resource was Listerine because it was easy to get and it did the job and it was cheap and I could walk in and buy it without showing anyone my ID. So I was drinking a lot of mouthwash. Um, it's not good on your stomach. I wouldn't try it. Um, so I was pissed off about this breakup or about this boyfriend cheating on me. So I brought a bottle of Listerine to school and drank it there. And, uh, things got bad fast. I went home and one of my friends had told my parents and they were pissed off. And, um, you know, we have this phenomenon of craving where we just need more and more. So I wasn't done. Um, I needed more. There was no alcohol in the house. And so my next uh, best idea was to drink rubbing alcohol to continue getting drunk. So, um, I drank some rubbing alcohol, um, Unlike Listerine, that's actually the wrong kind of alcohol. It's isopropyl alcohol. So what I did was poison myself. And I went to the ER, um, and they thought I was trying to kill myself. I had to explain to them that I was just trying to get drunk. And they put me in the psych ward after that. I was there for a couple days. Um, and I went to an outpatient program that was really awesome. But... Basically, in the hospital, I had this realization that my alcoholism is going to kill me, so I need to do this deal. So I finally started taking suggestions. Um, so I returned to school. Again, things were really hard with people, but I just finally realized I don't have the luxury of drinking. I'm, I am different, and it's not better or worse, but I'm different. So from then on, I kind of stopped trying to fit in with my old crowd and hung out with more and more sober people. Um, and things got easier and easier. And some days I felt really sorry for myself still, but I just really, um, got closer to people in this, in this program. And, um, I use the serenity prayer a lot. And, um, at that point, well, always, but 
the way I looked at it was, um, I would say, like, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is my alcoholism and the fact that I can't drink, the courage to change the things that I can, which would be the people that I'm hanging out with and the things that I'm doing, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that kind of kept my head in the spot that I need to do what I need to do, not what I want to do. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what my first year looked like was I struggled a lot and felt uncomfortable being in high school sober, but um, I kept doing it, and things got better and better. And um, I plans changed. I almost had a year sober. I had a little over a year sober, and um, I found out that I was pregnant. And that threw a loop of things. Um, I had plans to go to college and, like, try to live in the dorms and stuff. Um, but then I got pregnant, and uh, I was like, what now? So I decided to keep my baby. Um, I decided that I would not go live in the dorms because I was due to have him in the middle of my freshman year. So I went to um, Merrimack, and I... Um, did the same thing there. I didn't really, like, connect with a lot of people um, <clears throat> because I kind of was just there for school, and I kept my sober friends in AA. So that was my that continued to be my social life was AA. And uh, I took my last exam <clears throat> on a Tuesday and went in for my C-section on Wednesday on Christmas break and uh, had my son. And... Uh, it's funny how God works, because when I was 17, I would never have planned for things to happen that way. I did not think I was going to be um, a 19-year-old single mother in sobriety, and that's where God led me. And um, my life is so good today, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, I went Where I went to outpatient, I just want to share, is... Um, was this outpatient program. I loved my counselor there. She was awesome. And I was like, I want to do what you do. Like, you're awesome. So um, she was like, well, like, go to school to, like, do counseling or social work or something and come back and intern with me someday. So I was like, all right. So at that point, I was in high school. So I finished high school, um, got my gen eds done at Merrimack. And from there, I transferred to a, a local university. Um, and got my degree in human services. Um, did the same thing there, kind of connected with some people that were cool but not crazy drinkers, um, and kept hanging on to my AA friends, and um, that's been good enough for me. Um, I graduated Fontbonne last May, and now I'm getting my master's in social work at SLU. Um, and the coolest thing is I am now doing an internship at where I went to outpatient. Um, and I'm working alongside with my counselor that I had at outpatient, and she's the shit. And I see these kids every day that are exactly like me, and, like, I'll open their, my mouth and, like, read their mind, and they'll be like, how'd you know that? And I'm like, because I am you. <laughs> um, and it's just really, really cool. Things have really come full circle, and without having the fellowship in AA, I wouldn't have been able to stay sober because I wouldn't have had friends. Um, and if I would have gotten sober at 17 and not have not had had any fun, I wouldn't still be here. Um, but I found that people were there for me time after time. My friends that I drank with, um, they disappeared slowly and surely um, as I got sober, and I got more and more friends in AA. And They've carried me through this, through everything, um, and supported me through school. And um, my favorite thing to do, well, school-wise, is hang out at coffee shops and do homework. Um, and I have this amazing three-year-old son right now who is the center of my world. Um, and I'm doing my internship at my outpatient program and loving that. So, um I guess, yeah, that's my experience with uh, being sober in school, so thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was, that was incredible. And up next is Kansas from San Diego. Yeah, my name's Kansas. I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you guys for talking. Um, 
Sobriety date is July 2nd, 96. Um, sponsor is Paul C., Oceanside, California, and uh, Old North County Young People's Group. Um, I had a, my, my, my college, my collegiate experience was a little bit different um, than, than, than what I've heard so, so far up to this. Uh, I, uh, I, I got sober at 18. Um, I had no high school credits at all when I, when I got sober. Um, I, I did, however, have a GED. Um, I had stopped going to school after the eighth grade. Um, so I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous um, with my eighth grade education and a willingness to pass the baskets and make the coffee. Um, and the, so it was like, I, I, you know, I, I kind of came in here and I, I've, you know, I, I've sort of had to go back and fill in these sort of deficits in my education, you know, re reading some of these books that you would have read in high school. Like, I, you know, I, I'd realized that different people I'd worked with had all read The Great Gatsby, you know, and I'm like, well, what the hell's that? You know, and it's like I had, I had, you know, it's like I had a master's degree and I'm like, what the hell's The Great Gatsby, you know, and uh, <laughs> they're like, oh, it's this book that we all read. It was required reading. And, oh, oh, well, that's where that. That's why that ever never happened. Um, so I have to go back and, and, and sort of fill in these gaps as I went. And um, I, I, I remember it was in my first year of sobriety. You know, I, I started to. Uh, it, it all of a sudden the, the, the cobwebs started to sort of loosen up a little bit, and I could see a little bit of light came into my brain. And uh, once it came in, I. Um, I, I, I started reading my big book all the time, you know, and I say, I, I didn't get into this thing. And then I, I, you know, and then basically anything that said 12 steps, anything I started to read, you know, and, uh, one, one day my sponsor to, looks at me and he says, uh, you know, you might want to try reading some books that aren't blue also. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, I said, well, I don't know, you got any ideas. And so he loaned me a couple of, of, of books and, and just, you know, and I started to, I, I got sober in an area. There were no young people. Well, I take that back. There were three of them. One of them I lied about sleeping with, and her friend saw me, so she wouldn't be my friend. Um, that happened when I had 30 days. And uh, her best friend would, therefore, not be my friend. And then the other one ended up being my first AA stalker. So uh, <laughs> my young people's experience wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't Iggy Paw. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I, I end up... Uh, so instead, I would you could smoke at Denny's then. Um, I don't know so where some of you guys are. You might be able to do that now. Um, but I, I so I would go in the middle of the night and I would smoke at Denny's and I'd read books. You know, it's like because I was 18 and I didn't know what the hell else to do. You know, I, I would hang out at my sponsor's house. You know, I'd get you know he'd get off work. I'd wait until he got off work. I was going through this halfway house and then this Oxford house and all this stuff. And then I'd just wait till he got off work and I'd go over to his house and he'd just let me sit there. I mean, he'd come in one day and I'm shaving my head in the middle of his living room, you know. I mean, just, he, he put up with it. Um, but I thank him for that, you know, because he gave me a place to be. And um, and then, I mean, he would go to bed because he was a productive member of society, unlike I was. And then, so I would go to Denny's and I would, and I would drink because they keep refilling your coffee. They just, they never stop. And, and as long as, you know, I don't have an off switch. So as long as you bring me something, I will continue to consume it, whether I'm sober or not. And so there was, uh, and so, so I actually got a job at an espresso shop uh, during this time. And there were a couple times that I almost turned in my sobriety chips over the espresso. And I had to sit down and talk to my sponsor about how much I was drinking because people would, they figured this out at work and they'd, like, they'd screw up a drink and they'd pour the espresso in there. That has nothing to do with my schooling experience, though. Um, but so, you know, it was, you know, there, I, I took care of some, Sort of, you know, the beginning I didn't worry about school. Um, I know sometimes it's like there was, there's this sort of pressure to, especially from families and stuff like that. It's like, you know, okay, you've been sober for 22 minutes, now go graduate. Um, it's like, I'm trying to sort some shit out here, like, you know, not drinking on Tuesdays. And, um, so, you know, I, I just, I was like, oh, you know, I didn't worry about any of that stuff. And maybe that was easier for me because it wasn't like I walked in here, you know, with a, with a, with a glowing academic background that, you know, I mean, there was a little potential, I suppose. But, uh, you know, uh, people were just really happy I wasn't carrying a gun anymore. <laughs> you know, they were tripping on whether or not I was carrying a diploma anymore. Um, so it was really I spent the first few years just building a foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
You know, it was just building a foundation. I mean, I was doing, you know, I was doing, doing silly things like go to 90 meetings in 90 days, you know. Uh, I, I was uh, getting commitments in a home group, you know. I was sort of doing these sort of these things and making those my priority. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I when I was 18, I was walking, I was, a, I had been a ward of the court and I was walking out of foster care. So there was no, you know, there's like, there's no like family support or anything like that anyway. So let alone family pressure, you know, it's not like I, you know, there was no like college fund or anything like that. It was like, you're, if you're going to do this, you're going to do this because you're doing it. And, um, you know, it was some of the challenge, I, I, I faced a lot of challenges in getting through school. Um, I did the seven year community college plan. Um, I, it was not easy to get through there. You know, I would go a year where, you know, like I would buy these cars that were like three hundred and four hundred dollars because it was all I could sort of scrape together at the time. I had this one gray beast. I don't even know what kind of car it was, but it had duct tape. Like when I bought it, it had duct tape on the roof of it, and like that's how I'm like you know trying to get there every time. And um, you know there were other semesters where I, you know I, I would I would get my my classes paid for and then I couldn't afford my books. You know I remember when I signed up for classes I had to like write my papers at the library because I didn't have a computer. You know, I was like, this was sort of the the stuff. And I'm working full time through all this. You know, that's the only way that this is going to happen. I had to take, uh, I remember I had, I worked midnight to 8 a.m. on Friday nights. So like Friday night, I'd go in at midnight. And then I would go back in at 4 o'clock on Saturday and work till midnight. And then I'd go back in at 8 a.m. on Sunday so that I could get three shifts in on the weekend so that I would only have to do two during the week so I could make my classes. And I just, um, you know, with, with, you know, one semester the bus stopped running to my campus, you know, like I'm midway through a class, so I'm like dropping another semester, you know, because I just couldn't get home. You know, and, and at first I'm like walking the like two or three miles to get to a way so that I can get home. And then I got into a car accident and I screwed my back all up in this car accident. So it was like, pfft. I was like, it felt like there were some times where, where it just felt like I couldn't win, you know, and um, and I, w- I would talk to these different people. And I was like, you know, if nothing else, the thing that inspired me was that I did not want idiots to be my boss for the rest of my life. <laughs> I, I mean, if nothing else, there are stupid people that will tell you what to do for the rest of your life if you don't go do something about it. And I, I'm just, I have way too much ego and, and arrogance and pride and these defects of character that will ever allow me to do that. And so I, I just, uh, it was an, all the motivation that I needed to get in there and just make it work. And, um, you know, so I, um, you know, I kept going with it and I, and I, I did pretty well, you know, I started doing pretty well at school and, um, um, you know, I, I, I get through some of that and I ended up, I, I, I ended up enrolling in, uh, one that's set up more for, for working adults. Um, I finished my undergraduate in human services also, and um, it's kind of cool. My school symbol was an upside down triangle in a circle. You know, I guess they were started by the YMCA, and so it was like this, that whole sort of they had the same symbol as the YMCA, and um, you know, it, <laughs> really, um, so you know, I. Um, I, when I was 14 years old, being kicked out of my high school, um, you know, my, my vice principal is sitting there, you know, because the vice principals are like the bad cop at these things. And uh, he's he's looking at me and he's uh, he's telling me that I, I'm, you know, he told, he told me, you know, you're going to prison. That's it. There's, there's nothing else. There's nothing we can do for you here. All you are is a poison pill on my campus. And... Um, Good riddance, you know, good riddance. And right now I'm on my my undergraduate college's website as a distinguished alumni. You know, like they put up a website, you know, like a web page to to say this is what happens. And and you know what, my story's on there. Not the and it'll say that I'm in AA, but you know, it says you know I was a you know I was a screw up and all that kind of stuff and. Uh, I, I just kind of roll with it, you know. That works in my profession. It doesn't work in all professions, but it does in mine, and that's fine. Um, you know, you got to kind of take that for what it is for your own and apply apply where it fits. But uh, you know, it's on there and, it, and it's out there, and, it, and it's working just fine. And um, 
You know, I, I ended up, you know, I had to ask more experienced AA members that had done some of the things I'd done, whether the debt was going to be worth it, you know, and, you know, all these student loans. I went to graduate school. I, you know, I did a master's degree, you know, it's like, how am I going to sort this out? And um, I, I have a friend that's a pharmacist that got sober when he was 17, you know, he got his doctorate at USC. I mean, it was just like, I mean, the guy had probably a million dollars in debt, way more than I did. And, um, and, you know, so I sat down with him in our men's group and I started asking him, what do we do with this? You know, what do I do with this? And, um, and he reassures me and he reassures me that it's always going to be worth it. And then, you know, I, in graduate school, my psychopharmacology professor after 10 years quits a week before the class and they come in, they say, we don't know what we're going to do. And I say, I know. <laughs> And so my buddy comes in and he's the professor, you know, so, so my psychopharmacology guy, professor is my, my friend in AA, you know, who's uh, coming in and it was his opportunity to become a professor and that was what he wanted to. So, you know, by helping me, he got helped out a little bit and, um, you know, I, uh, you know, following all that, I had to go through this licensing stuff and, and everything else and, uh, you know, all while doing this, you know, there's... I'm going to meetings. Um, I'm a GSR three times during that. I'm a DCM during that. I'm on a young people's committee during that. You know, hosting a state conference during that. I mean, it's like there, Alcoholics Anonymous is my foundation throughout because that was what the focus was in the beginning of all this. And that's what the focus is as we go through all the, as I go through all this stuff. And that was where I learned how to complete assignments. You know, I learned how to complete assignments by completing them in AA. You know, of course, I'm going to go back there, you know, and I uh, and, and I think that there's an appreciation that a lot of people around here don't necessarily have for what we're doing, because AA really I mean, when you just look at the time period spent to be a good AA, this is we have an additional part time job. Just the hours spent, we have an additional part time job that the other students don't have. You know, and it is taxing and it's really hard to get through this stuff. And it's really hard to deal with the stress. And there were a lot of nights where, you know what, I didn't, I didn't want to get drunk because I wanted to, because I wanted to get oblivion. I just wanted to take the edge off the stress, you know, and I was 10 years sober and I wanted to just smoke a little pot at night. You know, that was the thing I wanted. That, that, that was where my alcoholism hit out was like, oh, just two hits, two hits at the end of the night, just so that I can freaking sleep, just so that I can stop thinking about the homework. You know, because I was just dying with it, just dying with it, you know, and, it, and, and you know, some of the things my, my sponsor had been, had been through graduate school and he would say things like, you know, there's, there are going to be people that haven't done this and don't understand, but there's a big difference between going to one meeting a week and going to none meetings a week. So there's a huge difference between going to one, being active in one home group a week. You know, you got a lot of years sober, your foundation is built, stay active in one group. And other than that, keep your service commitments up, but don't stop going to that meeting. Don't not be involved in that meeting because of this, uh, because you're going to die if you do. You know, there's a lot of years sober. He's telling me this stuff, you know, because I was a, I was a kid, you know, it's like I, we end up with, in young people's, we end up with time sober before we end up with any life experience. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We've got time sober and we start becoming old timers. We don't know what the hell we're doing with life yet. And, you know, I've got to have, I, I've really, it's really been important for me to have this sponsor that, you know, God, he's 40 years sober now and damn near and got sober when he was 21 and, you know, did college and did graduate school and, you know, and did young people's, chaired a young people's convention in 1983. <laughs> really? <laughs> really, dude? You know, he does not look like somebody I'd identify with, but he sure is. <laughs> She knows my sponsor. <laughs> no, he's a, he's a beady little chubby man. <laughs> and, he, and he's old and he talks like a Star Trek nerd. <laughs> Except he's usually talking about AA that way. Uh, he goes to archives conventions. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. These guys are worse than the Trekkies. They get together with little letters written by Oxford Group members and go hide it, and go hide in hotel rooms to show each other. I mean, it's because they don't want the masses to know they have it. <laughs> oh, they're bad. They're bad. But um, 
I, I really I want to thank the host committee. Um, I've had a good time. My my first young people's meeting ever in 1996 was in St. Louis. I got um, in 96 when I was 60 days sober. Somebody did the real first step with me, which isn't on our wall, which is shut up and get in the car. And um, somebody told me to shut up and get in the car, and I ended up here when um, uh, Narcotics Anonymous held a, a world convention in St. Louis in 96. And they don't do young people's over there. Um, their WSO isn't fond of the idea of young people's and have, they have their feelings about it. And so by word of mouth, we started a young people's meeting there. And so that was my first young people's meeting was under the arch right there. there were, I got to lead it. There were 100 people in there. So um, this is the first time I've been here since. So this has been really neat for me to be here for an paw. So thanks a lot, guys. Dude, thank you guys. Thank you so much. I think like uh, listening to you, um, I'm reminded of when I got in Alcoholics Anonymous and just listening to people that were that were doing this and were getting sober and were carrying on their lives was just really um it was powerful for me. And so to hear that and be reminded of that, I'm really grateful for the work that you did to get through it so that you could teach people like me um um how to get through it as well. So thank you so much. Please stick around and say thanks to the panelists. Um we're really grateful that um you guys uh Came here and we're so generous with your stories and your time. Um, so, how do we close this thing? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So, if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.